forward to that day. Amen. Wow, because he loved us, he died for us, and he saved us, and he's coming back. And what a wonderful, wonderful day that will be when we see Jesus Christ face to face. Let's turn our Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, there will be a QR code on the screen behind me, as well as in your bulletin. Well, maybe there won't be a QR code on the screen behind me, I forgot that. But it's in your bulletin, and uh, to be able to follow along with the sermon and this morning, I have invited our two summer interns to preach the sermon with me. Uh, these men, Jeshua and Daniel, have been a great blessing to our church. Uh, they have worked hard and done a lot of work. If you walk around the outside of the building, uh, you will see all the landscape work that they have done, all the bushes they've removed and dirt they've hauled out and rocks that they've installed. Uh, they have done a lot of work. And on top of that, they've ministered to our teens, to our kids. They've been involved in VBS. They have been such a great asset uh, to me and to Community Baptist Church. And I am so thankful uh, for these two young men. They have been a tremendous, uh, tremendous blessing. And this morning, I've invited these young men to join me in preaching a sermon. And uh, we will be considering some important truths regarding the responsibility of God's church from 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Paul is writing this letter to a man that he has spent a lot of time with. A man that he's invested a lot of time in. Timothy is now overseeing the church in Ephesus. And Paul writes this letter to Timothy and he declares in verse 14, These things I write unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou may knowest how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God. Paul wanted the church to know how it was to function in this world. 
And these behaviors that he was encouraging Timothy to focus on were a little bit different than the rules that we often teach about, about behavior in the house of God nowadays. Rules like don't run or don't talk during the message or no food in the auditorium or no gossiping. Uh, silence your cell phones. Now, that's a good rule. Go ahead and do that if you haven't done that yet. And a better one, don't sleep during the message, okay? Stay awake. These are rules of behavior that we often focus on when talking about the rules of the house of God. And these are good things. But there's much more to church than just outward behavior. And this morning, we're going to consider three truths regarding the house of God. What is the house of God? What is the message of the house of God? And, and what, what is the, the proper behavior for the house of God? Good morning. Good morning. Let's, Let's consider the first point. What, what is the church of the living God? Turn, Turn with me to 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Why would Paul tell Timothy this, though? The purpose of the church was clearly shown through the teaching and instruction of Paul. Was it just being redundant when he was saying this? Paul was addressing a Timothy who had already seen the ropes of ministry and the workings of the church. He was left to work in Ephesus against these teachers who had risen up and started to teach things that were dividing the church instead of strengthening it. As it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, shows how these people were being detrimental to the growth of the church by inspiring anger and confusion among the men with their meaningless debates, as well as letting the women show off their lavish lifestyles in the house of God, which in reality just caused distractions from what was really important, the truth of the gospel. These confusions seem to show signs of disorder and weakness in the church and drew these believers away from each other, but most importantly from God. However, Paul is giving Timothy this one statement of the church that holds a lot of power and conviction concerning the actions of the church. The church should be the pillar and ground of the truth. Both of these words are synonyms and mean support in terms of physical construction. When a building has pillars and a strong foundation which provides support, you shouldn't expect it then for it to crumble or fall under pressure. However, without proper care and maintenance over such construction, you can't expect it to last too long. Let's take a look at the Pantheon, which is considered a beautiful architectural wonder of the ancient world. The Pantheon was a pagan Roman temple that was basically dedicated to all the Roman gods and goddesses at the time. The word Pantheon itself comes from the two Greek words, pan, meaning all, and theos, meaning God. It was built in the city of Rome. This building was built between 25 and 27 BC. It's been over 2,000 years since it was built, and you can still see its wonder today. This piece of architecture was made of strong materials like brick, marble, concrete, and granite among other materials. However, despite all the strong materials that were used to build the Pantheon, it still had to be cared for and strengthened for continuously. The original Pantheon, built in 25 BC, was destroyed in a fire around 80 AD, but was then rebuilt by the Roman Emperor Domitian around 80 AD. But it was then struck by lightning that caused it to get destroyed by a fire again in 110 AD. However, it was restored by another Roman emperor, Hadrian, between 8118 and 8128. It was later converted into a church where the papacy preserved it for many years and we can still see it today. It can be speculated that these kings and leaders wanted to keep the pantheon preserved to show its beauty to the rest of the world. On the other hand, we have the Colosseum, another architectural icon of the Roman world. It's still the largest ancient amphitheater ever built, and you can still see it today. It was built fairly close to the time of the Pantheon. However, you can clearly see in these images that it's no longer in its form of glory. It's in ruins. It had a strong foundation with materials like brick, travertine rock, and concrete. However, even with such a strong foundation, this magnificent piece of architecture doesn't stand now as it did before. 
How come? Was the initial construction of the Pantheon of the Colosseum not enough for the last multiple millennia? Well, history tells us the Colosseum fell for multiple reasons. One being a great earthquake, and another being neglect. This glorious structure didn't have continued support from others to help it stand throughout generations. And so the Colosseum slowly went from being a highly respected and significant symbol of Rome and entertainment to a place that people can only imagine what it used to be like. Today it's a place in ruins. See, both the Pantheon and Colosseum had strong foundations. Architecture-wise, these are both masterpieces. One that continues to support, and the other was neglected. I mean, what good is it to intentionally put something up and then never work on it, develop on it, or rejuvenate it during times of despair? In the same way, as believers, we aren't just feeble sticks holding up a couple of bricks and stones. This is the house of God, and this is God's piece of work. We've been entrusted with the great truth of the gospel, which has the power to change lives. Paul telling Timothy that the church is so much more worthy and deserving to be preserved and strengthened than basically anything else. 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us the undeniable power of the gospel. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The church is something that seeks the praise of man, or is weak in strength, or is just another worldly sight for people to behold in awe. No, it's the source of life for those lost in darkness. How long can this last for? How long can the enthusiasm and zeal for God's work last in church where people come and go? When great and massive constructions used by many are being neglected and resulting in ruins, how can we as a church be the pillar and ground of the truth where persecution and hate is a common response towards God's children? I would imagine Timothy wrestled with this question in his mind as he was left in Ephesus to deal with this church without Paul being there in person to help guide him. Paul, who with God's help, had built the foundation of this church, but now moved on in his missionary journey. This church had a strong foundation, but was later being attacked by these false teachers who started to teach wrong doctrine that began to divide the church. Paul knew that in order for the church to thrive and stay united, it was necessary for there to be continued support all the time. This support comes from within. There is no way the church can be the pillar and ground of the truth of the gospel if we don't all behave with the understanding that the gospel is serious. The mystery of the gospel is a great thing. There's been countless bloodshed, tears, and sweat poured into the formation of many churches by those who desire to do God's work including the one that we're in as I speak. The Church of Essos was able to thrive because Timothy understood the seriousness of the gospel. He was able to strengthen and support the church because it wasn't just Paul who understood that the good news needed to be preached. There were others who realized that it wasn't just Paul's responsibility to hold up the truth in the church. It was also theirs. He gave all these instructions and guidelines in the previous chapters for the believers to understand that. The kings and leaders who built the Colosseum, the Pantheon, the Parthenon, and all these beautiful buildings we see today, they didn't want their efforts to go in vain. No, they wanted the whole world to see what they had created, and they wanted that to last. But what we're living and serving for is so much greater than the simple praise of man. It's for that salvation from eternal suffering for our friends, our neighbors, and those we don't know. But most importantly, it's for God, who came down to earth in the flesh and suffered and died for us when we didn't deserve it at all. He entrusted this truth to us, and it's not something we should take lightly. If there's anything we should take away from this verse, it's that we should all be serious about the gospel that heals us. We should behave in a way that reflects that seriousness, so that the truth will continue to stand in the church and in our daily lives. But what exactly is the truth that we should hold? Well, to quite simply answer that question, this is the truth that makes us who we are. You see, the church is the pillar of the already existing truth. The church does not create this truth or add to it, but rather the church exists solely because of that truth, and that is the truth of the gospel. You know, when you think about it, the gospel is really a story, but more specifically, it is the climax of God's love story, the point at which the foundation of God's plan of redemption was set, the moment of the single greatest act of love in history. Death, the first in a list of God's enemies, was defeated. While the gospel is a story, it's the truth behind that story that makes it worthy of the title, The Good News. So read with me, uh, verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, And without controversy, 
Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And the first truth that we see in that verse is that Jesus Christ, who is God, was manifest, was manifest or made tangible in the flesh. Immortal God took on the form of a mortal man. The king of the universe humbled himself to become a servant. But how is it that God could take on flesh? We know that as believers, our spirits have been saved and freed from sin, but while we still live in these mortal bodies, sin is still a part of us. And that's why Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, associates sinless perfection with the resurrection of the dead. He says in verse 11, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And so Paul says that he wants to attain to the resurre resurrection of the dead. But he's clear that he hasn't already attained it. Because that would mean he's perfect, right? But he can't be perfect because he's still human. So how is it that a perfect God could take on an imperfect body? How is it that a holy God could inhabit sinful flesh? Some have said that Jesus did not have a sin nature because the sin nature is believed to be passed down through the human father, but Jesus was born of a virgin, so without a human father, he would not have had the sin nature passed down to him. We know that Adam's sin resulted in the entire earth being cursed, and the animals becoming carnivorous, and the vegetation becoming difficult and sometimes even dangerous. On top of that, um, the human race was cursed to be slaves to sin. And on top of that, we know from Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but Jesus never sinned. This understanding makes it even more miraculous that Jesus died for us. The just for the unjust. The holy for the unholy. God took on corrupted flesh and died undeservingly. He took on the punishment for our sins. And that is the amazing truth of the gospel. God was manifest in the flesh. And it's a strange but beautiful truth. And as confusing and as complicated as all that is, we do know one thing for sure from the text. Jesus, although he was manifest in the flesh was justified in the spirit. Read that next part of the verse with me, back in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, God was manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit. And although it's not exactly clear what Paul means by this, I would say that it refers generally to his ministry and actions while he was on the earth. But how is it that God can be justified? Has he not always been just? Usually when we see that particular word or concept in the New Testament, it refers to the sinner being given right standing before God. But how could God be given right standing before himself? It's a weird concept. So what does it mean that he was justified? So there are a couple of possibilities as to what it could be referring to. Um, Matthew 3.16 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So it could be referring to when Jesus was baptized. He was justified in the Spirit or by the Spirit. If you read the word justified as vindicated or proven true, instead of saved or made right, you can see how that interpretation, it might, it might be understood that the Spirit vindicated Jesus to be the Son of God. This type of justification or vindication could also refer to his resurrection, or to his many miracles, or his virgin birth, or even a combination of all of those things. But regardless of what exactly it means, we know it to be true. Christ does stand rightly before God. He was slain for our sins, and he was proven to be the true Messiah in his baptism, his teachings, his many miracles, and especially his resurrection from the dead. And the combination of these two things, God being manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit, makes for the greatest and most widely spread story in history. In this story, I mean, it was so widely known, in fact, that it spans multiple dimensions. As you see in this verse, Jesus was not only manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit, he was seen of the angels and preached unto the Gentiles. I mean, the gospel changed everything. Right? One of the few things we know about angels is that uh, they want to see what's going on down here for some reason. First Peter 1.12 says, Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. I remember being here in this church for an Easter Sunday and watching a video representation of Jesus' crucifixion and how heart-wrenching it was to watch our Savior suffer. I remember being up in the choir and we're trying to sing, to follow that presentation, to sing about the blood of Christ. And we're all getting all choked up because we've just watched it and it's so emotional and so terrible to watch our Savior go through that. And so I can only imagine how the angels must have reacted to seeing that. Straining to look over to see each other, as, uh, to see over each other as their king suffers. Heaven's eye mournfully watching its king as he is handed over to the forces of darkness. But it was not in vain. 
the message of the gospel was then preached to the Gentiles. Hope was spread to the world. Not only did God's chosen people of Israel get their Messiah, the Gentiles received a Savior. The gospel's amazing whatever dimension you're in, or whatever nationality you may be from. It, wasn't, it didn't just change a little bit over here in Israel where Jesus walked the earth. It didn't change a little bit in Greece or in the empires of Rome after Paul took the message there. It changed everything. And now we see that Christ was given the glory in that he was believed on in the world and received up into, the, into glory, as that last part of the verse says. With this truth, we are given hope. Christ is glorified in our belief. And a great thing was accomplished as the gospel message was received around the world, and God turned many people back to himself. And although Jesus left earth when he ascended back to heaven, he did not leave us without hope. He left us with the hope that he is alive, and that one day he will return to bring us to glory. That one day the earthly and the heavenly will no longer be two separate realms, but they'll be one. One day our Lord in heaven will return to bring them back together. We will be with the Lord forever. But for now, that's only a hope. For now, we are the church, the church of the living God. And we have been assigned to uphold this message of the gospel. So we've seen that we're the house of God. We've seen what the message of the house of God should be. So how should that affect our lives? How should that affect the way that we live on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, that's what Paul was writing to Timothy about. He said in verse number 14, he said, These things I write unto you. I'm hoping to come to you shortly. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. So I write these things to you that you may know how you ought to behave in the house of God. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And what is that truth? How should we behave? Well, in chapters 1 and chapter 4, Paul said that the proper behavior of the house of God is to fight against false teachers and false doctrines. He said in chapter 1, verse number 3, he said, As I besought thee to buy still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't let them teach something that's false. Don't let false teachers come in. Don't let people who stand against the truth of the word of God to come in. Stand against them. Fight against them. As Daniel has stated, the church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. When someone teaches or preaches something that is not true, we as the church have the responsibility to stand up for what is true. We are to be the salt. We are to be the light that influences our world. We're not to just see ground. We're not to just sit by idly and say, oh, yeah, I'll just let them go off. We are to stand for the truth of the word of God. If we don't stand for the truth, who will? Who will? We are to stand against false doctrines. Paul was even willing to call out by name. Those who were problem makers. It said in verse number 20 of chapter 1. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. How would you like your name to be recorded for all of eternity in a negative sense? The word of God is eternal. It's going to last forever. And these two guys for eternity are going to be known as false teachers who didn't promote the truth. But... When we know and we see people that preach something that is not true, we must be willing to stand up and call them out by name that what they're saying is not true. We are the pillar and ground of the truth. In chapter number 2, Paul states that the proper behavior of the house of God is to pray. He said in verse 1, he said, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. We're to pray for all men, but we're especially to pray for those who are over us, our government leaders, those who have the responsibility. Why? So that we can lead a purposeful life, a quiet life. God's desire... God's plan is for things to be restored back to the way he created it. At the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. It was wonderful. And just like man always does, we messed it up. We sinned. 
And everything has been deteriorating ever since. And God's desire is for it to be restored. And that's what we should be praying for. We should be praying for our government leaders so that we can live a Eden-focused life. And our prayers must be offered by a people who are holy and full of faith. He says in verse number 8, lifting up holy hands without wrath. As you pray for your government leaders, are you angry with them? Is it anger that's driving you to do those things? Without wrath and full of faith, without doubting. We're to be faith, trusting God. Man, it looks bleak around here. Man, things just keep getting worse. Man, how can we elect people like that? God, what are you doing? But we trust God. We lift up holy hands without wrath. Without, without being angry, without, without doubting. doubting. The church of God is to be a house of prayer. God's people need to be people that pray. Our prayer meetings on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock should be packed. Because God's people should be a people that pray. We should be a people as the pillar in the ground of the truth that lift up our voices to God and pray for God to work in this world. We need to be a fervent people who pray. The church of God should be full of people who pray. That is how we behave as the pillar in ground of truth. The church of God in chapter number 3, he says that our proper behavior is to be led by godly leaders. We should choose godly leaders. In these verses, he states that the leaders in verse number 1, he said this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop. Let me just state this real quick for moms and dads and, and young people. It doesn't say if God is someone is called to the office of a bishop, if he desires of it. You know, if, you're, if your kids desire to be a pastor, that's a good thing. If any man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. We should encourage our young people to want to be pastors, to be desires to be pastors. And if they have that desire, encourage them to pursue it. If any man desires the office of a pastor, he desires a good work. I tell people all the time, I have the greatest job on the face of the earth. I have the privilege... Of preaching God's word. I have the privilege of telling other people about Jesus Christ. And you guys pay me to do it. That's unbelievable to me. I, I hesitate to say this, but I do it for free. I love it. It's the greatest thing in the world. To be able to preach God's word. And it's a wonderful thing. We should be encouraging our young men. To say, God, here am I. Send me. To be pastors. And then he said the other office that he's established in verse number 8 is likewise, must the deacons be grave. So two offices, pastors and deacons within the church. And then if you your eyes skim through these verses, he talks about the characteristics of them. They must be blameless. They must be of good behavior. They must not be greedy or brawlers or covetous. They must be men of character. Godly men, we must choose people to lead our church if we're going to be the pillar and ground of the truth that are led by a godly people. Not just people that speak well, not just people that are friendly, but godly people who love Jesus Christ, who are full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, the deacons they chose. That is how we're to be the pillar and ground of the truth. In chapter 5, Paul states that the proper behavior of the house of God is we care for people. The gospel changes us. We're to be the most generous people on the face of the earth. He said in verse number 1 of chapter 5, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. We should treat the elderly with respect. We should care for other church members. He said in verse 2, The elder woman is mothers and younger as sisters with all purity. We should treat other church members as brothers and sisters of the family of God. We should love one another. We should care for those who, who can't care for themselves. He said in verse 16, If any man or woman that believe has a widow, let him relieve them. And let not the church be charged. And so that, what that means is if your mom or dad, if your mom is a widow, you have the responsibility to care for him. It's your job, not the government's, not the gut churches. It is your job to care for your parents if they're widows, your moms. Now, what reason should you do that? In verse 16, he says, that may relieve them, that the church be not charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So the church can focus on helping those whose kids are reprobates, he calls them. 
who don't care for their parents, who don't love them so the church can step in and really focus on them. The church is to care for them and minister to them who can't care for themselves. We shouldn't fight with other people, he said in verse 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. God wants the people of the house of God to be generous and kind to other people. He, and as we do so, we uphold the truth of the gospel. And what is that truth of the gospel? That it makes us like God. That's the truth of the gospel. Jesus saved us to make us more like himself. More like Jesus Christ. The most generous and loving person that ever lived. And that's how we uphold the truth of the gospel, is by living it, by a transformed life. In chapter 6, Paul indicates that the proper behavior of the house of God is to live a godly life. We must be different than the world around us. He talks about in chapter 6 how the world it loves money, which is the root of all evil. They're driven by money. You know, our world is driven by money. The education they pursue, the jobs that they pursue, everything is driven by the fact can they make more money. We always want more. We always want the newest and the best stuff. But God says his people should be different. We should flee the desires of this world. He says in verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after, notice this, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's basically the fruit of the Spirit. We're not to pursue after the things this world does. We're to pursue to become more like Jesus Christ and to be controlled by His Spirit. And as we do that, we store up treasures in heaven. He says in verse 17, Charge them that are not rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in a living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up for yourself, for themselves, uh, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that we may lay hold on eternal life. We are to live for eternity and for heaven. We don't live for now. That's not the focus of the church of the living God. We live to be godly and holy and righteous, focusing on the life to come, not on covetousness and the things of this world which go away. These are the ways that we should behave ourselves as the house of God. Standing for truth, praying, selecting godly leaders, caring for others, and living a godly life. And so Paul, writing to this young pastor Timothy, wants them to know as the church what, that he is leading, what should they be focusing on. They are the symbol of the living God. Never forget that. You are the assembly of the living God. You are the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went to heaven. He's not here physically. He's left you to be his representative. Each of us are his body to live as Jesus Christ in our respective part of the world. And that truth, that reality should impact the way we live. That Jesus Christ saved us to make us more like him. He died for us. And that's what the gospel is all about. How are you behaving in the house of God? I ask you, are you upholding the truth of the word of God? Not just with your words. So many, get it's so easy for them to get bombastic. I mean, get on Twitter or Facebook. And Christians, they are the most, they fight. Oh, how dare they say that? And how dare they do that? And they get so angry about everything and their words. And we should speak the truth. I am not denying we should stand up for the truth. But we shouldn't just speak it. We should live it. It should be followed. If you don't live it, your words don't have much impact. But man, when someone who lives a godly life, who loves Jesus Christ, then says, you know what? The truth changed me. This is what the truth looks like. This is why we believe the truth. Because the gospel is powerful. And so we should live for God. We should preach the truth of the gospel. And we should love other people. And that is what the gospel, it makes a difference. And are you upholding the truth with your words in your life? Are you boldly proclaiming the wondrous story that man, or that God became man to die for us? Are you allowing the gospel to impact every area of your life? Are you behaving as the house of God 
the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. That's how we're to behave. It's good not to run in church. Except if I'm chasing your kids, they shouldn't run in church, okay? I get in trouble with that all the time. We should turn our cell phones off. We shouldn't be talking to the people around us, especially when we're singing praises to our God and we're studying the Word of God. We should be engaged. We should be focused. Those are good things. That's a good way to behave in the house of God. But the main way is to be a pillar in the ground of truth, to stand up for the truth, and to uphold the wondrous mystery that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary to make us more like him. And so we're a changed people. Are you behaving properly as the house of the living God? Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress his love upon your heart this week.